In this video, I'm going to talk about section 5.1, which is on normal distributions. Uh, there's a lot of information covered in normal distributions, and while I'll go over a fair bit of it right now, some of it is not as important. So when they get into actually talking about calculating p-values and doing like hypothesis testing using normal distributions, while I'll show them to you right now, there is going to be a better way to do this and a more correct way to do this next week. And um, <clears throat> And I'm just pretty much introducing this to you and showing it to you because your book does this and it is common to approximate things with a normal distribution. But you should know that what I'm going to be showing in this lecture and what your book is telling you about are not really how things are, people are doing these in, in, uh, in real life. So let's begin with a motivating example. So we could have the following research question. Um, um, let me stop for a second. We might be interested in uh, looking at vegetarians in the U.S. So we could have this as kind of a motivating example. A Gallup poll of 2000, uh, from 2018 asked 1,033 Americans, in terms of your eating preferences, do you consider yourself to be a vegetarian? To which 53 responded yes, so approximately 5%. In an Ipsos survey of approximately 20,313 people from 28 countries found that 8% of all respondents identified as vegetarian. And we'll use that sort of as our estimate of, of the percent of all humans that are vegetarians in the world. So we may be interested in the following research question. Is the proportion of vegetarians in the U.S. lower than the proportion of vegetarians in the world? So we'd set up this null and alternative hypothesis. So we'd have this null hypothesis, which states that the proportion of all Americans who are vegetarian is equal to 0 0.08. And the alternative could be the proportion of Americans that are vegetarians is less than 0 0.08. So our null is that we have this approximate, we have the same proportion of vegetarians in the U.S. as there are in the world. And the alternative could be that there are fewer vegetarians in the U.S. So how do we go about answering this question? So far, you've learned about how to do this using a randomization distribution. So what you would naturally do at this point is you would go and you would open up stat key you would navigate to uh, test for a single proportion. You'd click edit data. You'd type in 52 for count because there were 52 Americans. You would um, type in 1,033 because that was the sample size. And then you would generate, say, 10,000 samples. And then you were going to end up with this randomization distribution like this. <clears throat> and so what, you'll, what you then do to try to find your p-value is you're going to click left tail because it's a, an alternative hypothesis with a less than sign. And then you're gonna put the value of 0 0.050 in, and then you're gonna obtain this as your p-value. So your p-value is going to be 0 0.0001, <clears throat> which we would interpret as, given that the proportion of all Americans that identify as vegetarian is 0 0.08, in other words, the world average, the probability of observing a sample proportion as extreme or more then 0 0.05 is 0 0.001. So it's very unlikely that we would observe a proportion of Americans that are vegetarians that are that small in, in if the total proportion of Americans that are vegetarian is 0 0.08. So that's how we would do this right now, naturally, right? At this point, we would use the randomization method because that's the method that we've learned. <clears throat> And in thinking about what that p-value also tells us, it tells us that there's very strong evidence in, su in support of the alternative hypothesis. Uh, in other words, that's what IE means, that the proportion of Americans that identify as vegetarians is less than the proportion they do in the world. So we have strong evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. We have weak evidence against, I mean, weak evidence against the, I mean, strong evidence, excuse me. We have strong evidence against the null hypothesis and strong evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. If we set alpha to be equal to 0 0.05, then our p-value would be less than alpha, so we would reject the null hypothesis. And just as review two, that would mean we could either have observed correct results or we could have committed a type one error. We could not have committed a type two error because we reject the null hypothesis. But let's look at this for a second. How would you describe the shape of this? I'm guessing many of you would describe the shape of this as bell-shaped. 
Um, and given at this particular point in the semester, most of you would probably even use the word normal. So if this has a normal distribution, couldn't we somehow use that information? Well, that's exactly what we're going to do. So in this slide right here, what I've done is I've drawn a, a roughly a normal curve over this. And we see that, well, you know, it looks like it probably does a reasonably good job of approximating this. Oh, and then there's one other thing I want to say here. Oh, no, I, I will mention it soon. So let's think about a normal distribution. And let's talk about them. So we really haven't formally talked about normal distributions um, so far this semester. Just trying to fit this whole thing on here. <clears throat> So normal distributions are going to be bell-shaped, right? We've said that they're bell-shaped, they're symmetric. Um, as, I've, as I've said a few different times throughout this semester, you cannot have a bell that is not symmetric. So any bell-shaped distribution will be symmetric. And normal distributions are described by two parameters. They're described by their, their mean, which we represent as mu. And then they're described by their standard error, I mean, their standard deviation, which we call sigma. And then we'll write a normal distribution using this notation right here, where it's we write it n, and we write what the mean is, and then we write what the standard deviation is. That's what that shorthand says right there. So we'll write n mu comma standard deviation. And then that tells us what the mean of the normal distribution is, and tells us what the standard deviation of the uh, distribution is. Well, that's really pretty cool because all you need to know to describe a, a normal distribution are these two parameters. If you tell me what the mean is of the normal distribution and you tell me what the standard deviation is, I can draw that normal distribution. So let's look at this. So what we have in this slide is we have two normal distributions. This gray one over here um, is centered at zero. You can see that there, right? So it kind of drops down to zero. And then this gold one over here is centered just a little under two and a half. And in fact, if you look over here, you can see that it has a mean of two, the gold one does, and that the gray one has a mean of zero, <clears throat> right? Because that's what that first number is. The first number is the mean. And then that second number is the standard deviation. So they both have the same standard deviation. And we can tell that as well without even needing to look and see that so their standard deviations are one here. But if you look, if you were to compare this area right here to this area right here, they're going to be the, it's going to be the same shape. It's like they're, they're mirrors. It's like all you've done is you've sort of slid that gray one down to the left or you've pulled that gold one up to the right. They have the same shape because they have the same... Uh, standard deviations, and all the means have done is they've sort of located them in different places along the x-axis. <clears throat> now, what do they look like when they have different standard deviations? So what I've drawn here is, again, I've drawn a gray, the same gray normal distribution, and it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Now, what I've done for the gold one is I've given it the same mean as the gray one, but a different standard deviation. This standard deviation is twice as big. And what we can see here is that these values in the, in the, gray, uh, in the gold one are spread out over a larger, um, area, a larger area over the x-axis, right? We can see that like <clears throat> if we were to um, uh, cut these in half, that the weight or the amount of, of values are going to be spread over a larger area um, for that gold one. So it's going to be more spread out. The, the gray one has got the values more tucked in. So the standard deviation, as, as we've discussed throughout the semester, what it acts to do is to pull values away. So the larger the standard deviation, the more spread out the values are. So both of these have normal distributions. I mean, both of these are normal distributions. Just one of them has a larger standard deviation. And this, this one up here, this normal with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one is a very special uh, distribution. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that momentarily. <clears throat> so how can we exploit this information? How can we actually use this information in order for us to, um, say, do hypothesis testing? 
Well, a p-value can be obtained from a normal distribution. And to obtain the p-value from a normal distribution, we need to set that mu parameter, which is the mean, to the value of our null hypothesis value. And then what we want to set sigma to is the standard error from the randomization distribution. So we'll know what the value of the null parameter is from our null hypothesis. Right? So in this case, our null hypothesis value is 0 0.08. <clears throat> And we'll want to set this, the standard deviation, which is what that sigma is, to the standard error from the randomization distribution. And if you look above, you'll, you'll see that the standard error is 0 0.0083. That's what we estimated in the randomization distribution. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons I'm telling you that what I'm doing is really strange is that you would never use a randomization distribution to find a standard error and then use a normal distribution because then you're doing essentially the, the work twice. You're either going to use a formula-based method or you're gonna use the randomization-based uh, method. And I'm showing you this because it maps onto your textbook and because it's a way to sort of um, conceptually understand how these things are linked. So what we can do is we can use this information. We can use this value as the mean, as mu, and this value as sigma. <clears throat> And I'm showing you here in this slide again where I get my mu and where I get my sigma from. So if we wanted to see what it looked like as a normal distribution, this is what it looks like. It has this normal distribution shape. It's centered at 0 0.08. And the standard deviation is going to be 0 0.0083. That's what our standard deviation is. And if we were to go out two standard deviations in both directions, we'd expect to obtain 95% of our values because, because that's going to be what you're going to see when um, you're going out two standard deviations. So how do we do this in StatKey? So we would open up StatKey, and so far we've been looking at the bootstrap, We've been looking at randomization tests, but now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come over here and look at normal. So you'll click normal and it will look like this. By default, it will have this normal distribution here and it will have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. That's how we can write that. So what you'll do is you'll click that edit parameters button You'll type in 0 0.08 and 0 0.0083, and you'll hit OK. Or... And then what you'll do is you'll click this left tail, because our alternative, so our, if we remember, our null hypothesis was that the population um, proportion of vegetarians in the US was 0 0.08, and the alternative was that it was less than 0 0.08. So we'll click the left tail here, and then we'll need, we'll need to change this value here to our sample statistic, which was 0 0.05. And then that will give us our p-value. It doesn't look like I actually did that here. So I will show you how to do this in stack key really quickly. So again, you'll click normal, click edit parameters, you'll change this to 0 .08. Um, Eight, and we'll change that to point zero zero eight three. Hit OK, and then we'll click left tail, and we're not notice we're not collecting samples or anything. We'll change this value to point zero five, and our p value is point zero zero one five which I think is the same thing we had from before, which 0 0.001, I think, is what it was before. But now it's 0 0.0015. So then this becomes 0 0.0015, um, I think is what it was. That's right. Oops, sorry about that. So that's our p-value. Our p-value is going to be the area to the left of that, the area that's less. So previously, we were thinking about p-value as being the, the proportion of samples that were as extreme or more, but we can think about it if we're using a normal distribution as the area that's to the left. 
And this entire area of this normal distribution is going to um, sum up to one or integrate up to one. Uh, and that's because our, our values are going to run between zero and one, our p-values will. So I told you that this um, standard normal distribution or excuse me, I told you that the normal distribution with the mean of zero and the standard deviation of one was really special. And it's called a standard normal distribution. And so the standard normal is just defined as a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Now, the really cool thing is that we can put any value x onto any other normal, uh, any other distribution we want to do by using this z formula down here. <clears throat> So what we can do is we can have our value x, we can subtract out the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. Boy, that looks an awful lot like this formula we learned earlier this semester, which is our z-score. And in fact, these are the exact same things. These are the same formulas. So they're going to be, they're going to represent how far value is from the mean divided by the standard deviation. And that's, and if we set the mean, if we make x uh, and we make mu 0 and the standard deviation 1, then that is going to, excuse me, that is not right. <clears throat> if we subtract out the mean and divide by the standard deviation, that will allow us to, to, to get into a standard normal distribution. I'll show you how to do that momentarily. But let's, let's first work with this normal distribution, uh, with, with, a, with a normal distribution. So... Let's say we have a normal distribution, and it has a mean of 40 and a standard deviation of 50. Just remember, this is the mean, and this is the standard deviation. What we'd like to do is find the area to the right of 60. So we're going to do this two ways. First, we're going to use a normal distribution that has a mean of 40 and a standard deviation of 15. And so what we would do is we would do this in stat key, just the same way that I previously showed you. And you're going to end up finding that the area to the right is 0 0.091. And, and I'll show you just quickly in stat key how to do it again. So we click parameters. I think I said it was 40 is the mean. The standard deviation is 15. You hit OK. Here's our normal distribution. We're going to want to find the area to the right is what I asked for in the question. We'll change that value from 69.4 to 60. Hit return. And there it is, 0 0.091. <clears throat> so that's, that's the way we can do it. We can use the normal distribution directly. But one reason we don't want to use the normal distribution directly is that there are actually an infinite number of normal distributions. And so that's what was the motivation behind doing the standard normal distribution is, well, what if we could just take all of these normal distributions and just put them in one place? Then, then before there were computers, what we could do is we could just have a single table. And if, if you maybe learned um, statistics in high school, you maybe had to look up z-scores and stuff in the back of, uh, you had to look up z and z-tables in the back of textbooks. And that was really for a time before computers were like they are nowadays. Um, but still, people use standard normal distributions. But the reason why people want it, you would want to convert to a standard normal distribution is that you could then just go and look up the information in a textbook. So how would we convert this to a standard normal? <clears throat> so you convert to a Z and then use the standard normal distribution. So how do we do that here? Well, first we want to convert it to a z, which I told you is going to be x minus mu over sigma, which is still that same formula as x minus x bar over s. So in this case, x is 60, the mean is 40, our standard deviation is 15. So it's 20 divided by 15, which equals 1.333. <clears throat> and that 3 is repeating. So if you were to go into stat key, by default, it's going to be set up that the mean is 0, the standard deviation is 1. You click that right tail button, and then you would change this value down here to 1.33, 
And there again is your same area of 0 0.091. And I'll quickly show you how to do that in stat key. So we will we'll quick reset the plot. <clears throat> it's already set up to the normal, standard normal. See how it has the mean of zero, and standard deviation of one. We'll click the right tail. We'll set that value um, to one point, oops, 1.333. And there it is again, 0 0.091. So we're getting the same results, rather we use our normal distribution or we go ahead and we use the, the normal distribution um, <clears throat> Uh, or if we use the standard normal distribution. So how can we obtain a p-value for our vegetarian example using the standard normal distribution? Uh, if you remember right, our p-value before was 0 0.00015, and we got a p-value from that using the normal distribution, and we got a p-value for that um, also using the randomization. Well, we can again use this same formula here. We can take our, our, our value, this value right here of 0 .0, 0 0.05. Well, that's our sample statistic. And what we can do is we can subtract out that null hypothesis value, and then we can divide by the standard error. Uh, this formula is referenced in your textbook, I think on page, let me see. It's on page um, 379, but I don't really like to write it like that because if you look here, it's really just the same formula again. So why do we have to keep giving it different names for things? <clears throat> so it's your sample stat minus your null hypothesis value divided by your standard error is going to be just the x value minus that mean, which was 0 0.08, divided by its standard deviation, which was 0 0.083. And that value equals negative 3.61. So this, we've placed this onto a standard normal, just to make that clear. We've placed it onto a standard normal. So we can use that mean here, the standard deviation of 1, and then we type the value of negative 3.61 in here, and we get that same value. So you can use a normal distribution directly, or you can use a standard normal indirectly after you've converted to a Z. Now, the standard normal is going to be important because a lot of the tests that we're going to be working with in the future are going to have this, this um, for, similar format of having your sample statistic minus the null hypothesis value over the standard error. That is going to be a very common formula for our test statistics, which we're going to be calculating. And in fact... This value right here, this negative 3.61, this would be called a Z statistic. And then when we actually calculate a P value, that would be called a Z test. That part, you don't really have to worry about it so, so much right now. Um, because like I said, the Z test and the Z statistic pieces are really just for more conceptual understanding. What are going to be more important are when we start talking about proportions tests and we talk about T tests. And we will get to that in the future. So why does this work? You may have been wondering so long, so far, well, how come all these things sort of like work so that they have this normal distribution? Well, there's this theorem and it's called the central limit theorem. And really the extent that you need to understand and know the, the central limit theorem is the extent to which I've written it here. You just really need to know that for random samples with a very large sample size, the distribution of their sample statistics can be approximated with a normal distribution. And we've seen that already when we're using bootstrap distributions and we've been using randomization distributions, um, that, that these uh, sample statistics can be approximated with a normal distribution. We've seen it for means, we've seen it for proportions, we've seen it for difference in means, we've seen it for difference in proportions, and we've seen it for correlations. So it's really this idea that if you have a, if you have a large enough sample size, and you have random samples, <clears throat> and then your sample statistics will be approximately normal. And this really shouldn't surprise you because, like, again, this is something we've been going, going over throughout the semester. So I'll periodically reference the central limit theorem, but the, the extent to which you really need to understand it is what's written here. So let's do one more example before I, I close off here um, for section 5.1. And that is, we'll look at the body temperature example again. 
So the question is, is the average body temperature different from 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit? So 50 men and women had their body temperature and pulse rates recorded. Let's use the, using the data, we are interested in testing whether the average body temperature is different from 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So here, whenever I give you the research question, you need to make sure it maps onto our alternative hypothesis. Here, different is clearly indicating a direction for the null hypothesis, I mean for the alternative hypothesis, or a sign, excuse me, not a direction, a sign. And different is going to mean not equal to. So we have average body temperature. Well, average is mu. We only have one group. Even though it says men and women, we don't have two different. We're not asking about their separate body temperatures. We're just talking about them together. So we just have a single mean. We know it's going to be equal to. We know it's going to be equal to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And that this one is going to be not equal to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And the not comes from the fact that I had the word different here. So let's calculate the p-value using a randomization test, a normal distribution, and then the standard normal distribution. So let's first start off with A here. <clears throat> Go to stat key, randomization test. We're going to test for a single mean. Body temperature is your first one there. So you can click generate 10,000 samples. So we see here that our standard error is 0 0.107. That's going to be important because we, unfortunately, at this point, do not have a formula yet for standard errors, which we will next week. But until then, we're going to use the randomization distribution to estimate it or to use a bootstrap to estimate it. So what we need to do here is we need to, um, because our alternative was not equal to, we can do a, right, a two-tailed test. And because our sample statistic of 98.26 is less than our null hypothesis value, We'll click this value here on, on the left side. We'll type in 92.86, 98.26, and we see that our p-value is going to be 0 0.0006 times 2, so 0 0.0012. So we'll come back over here, so 0 0.0012, and our standard error we said was 0.107. But this was our p-value from our randomization distribution right there. Okay, so now let's look at it with just using a normal distribution directly. So our normal distribution, if we're going to not use the standard normal, which is a remember, reminder has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1, it's going to be a normal, and it's going to have a mean of our null hypothesis value. So it's going to be the mean is going to be 98.6. And then, oops, let's get rid of that. And then the standard, uh, standard deviation is going to be 0 0.107 because I said the standard deviation is our standard error in this case. And so just to give us a reminder of what it's going to look like, it's going to look like this. It's going to be centered at 98.6. We're going to want to find our value over here, which will be 98.26. It's going to be this area over here, which we're then going to multiply by 2. Or, it's, or we can also think about it as just being, you know, both those areas both of those tails, right? Because that's what we're trying to do when we're doing that do not equal sign. So let's come over back over to stat key. Click stat key. Click normal. Our mean is 98.6. Our standard deviation is 0 0.107, which as a reminder is a standard error of the randomization distribution. If we click OK. Um, we're going to do a two-tailed test. We're going to change this value down here in the lower left to 98.26. Click OK. And here is our value, 0 0.0074, 0 0.0074. So that is 0 0.001148. Uh, 1, which is very close. 0 0.00148. Is going to be our p-value from our normal distribution and see how it's really close to this right now this p-value up here for a is simulation based 
And then this, this p-value here is based off of the normal distribution. But our normal distribution, our standard error, is based off of our randomization distribution. So as well as the randomization distribution can be approximated by a normal distribution is how close we're going to be in those two estimates. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So now let's look at C. We want to do it with a standard normal distribution. So in order to do that, we have to convert our, our values over to the standard normal. So as a reminder, the standard normal is going to be Z is going to equal X minus mu over sigma, which you can also think of as a sample stat minus the null hypothesis value over the standard error. So our sample stat was 98.26, our null hypothesis is 98.6, and our standard error is 0 0.107. If we do that math, hang on one quick second, 98.26 minus 98.6, 0.107, we get negative 3.71, negative 3.177. So another thing to say about this that I, that I forgot to mention above is that this negative 3.177 is also a z-score. So this is, this is a z-score. So this represents how many standard deviations away from the mean um, our value is. So this would say that a value of 98.26 is 3.177 standard deviations below the mean, which is 98.6, which is quite large. So let's go back to stat key. We'll reset the plot. We can work directly in this now. We'll click left tail. We'll click n type in negative 3.177, hit OK. And we see um, our value is 0 0.0074. We can also do that as a right tail, right? So sorry about that. Probably should have made sure I, I did that. Just to be consistent, um, 3.177. And now we see we have the exact same p-value again. Which makes sense because all we've done here is we've just transformed it. We've transformed our normal distribution um, from just a general normal one to a standard normal one. So we get the same p-values here. So hopefully this makes sense. Hopefully um, the idea of doing this uh, and starting to work with normal distributions is going to make sense. Um, we'll spend this next uh, Monday and Wednesday, maybe a little bit on Friday, but at least Monday and Wednesday working on um, the, the normal distribution and doing stuff like this, at, like doing some examples like this. And then on Wednesday, um, we'll continue with the normal distribution and work on confidence intervals. And then maybe on Friday or the following week, we'll start moving into to t-tests. So I hope this has been helpful. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks.